McDonald's Massacre Part 1. On July 18th, 1984, James gathered a small arsenal of weapons. His wife asked him where he was going. He replied, I'm going to hunt humans. He had been at the same McDonald's earlier that day with his wife and children. This time, James was returning alone with a semi-automatic rifle, a semi-automatic pistol, and a 12-gauge pump shotgun. He told his family goodbye. I won't be back. 45 people were inside the McDonald's restaurant in San Isidro, California. James entered the building and first shot a 22-year-old woman named Kane below her left eye. She died minutes later. He then shot a 16-year-old employee, John Arnold, in the chest and arm. James yelled, quote, everybody get on the ground. He then called everyone in the restaurant, quote, dirty swan Vietnam assholes and claimed that he had, quote, killed a thousand and intended to, quote, kill a thousand more. After James's racist rant, 25-year-old Victor Rivera tried persuading James not to shoot anyone else. James responded by shooting Victor 14 times and repeatedly shouting, shut up, as Rivera wailed in pain. Customers ducked under tables and crowded together, seeking protection from the crazed gunman. That's when James turned his attention towards six women and children huddled together. Hi, I'm Cam, and this is the McDonald's Massacre Part 2. That's when James turned his attention to six women and children huddled together. He shot 19-year-old Maria in the chest. He then fatally shot 9-year-old Claudia in the stomach, cheek, thigh, hip, leg, chest, back, armpit, and head with his Uzi. He wounded Claudia's 15-year-old sister and shot 11-year-old Aurora with his shotgun. That's when her pregnant aunt, 18-year-old Jackie Reyes, shielded her niece. James shot Jackie 48 times. Jackie's son, 8-month-old Carlos, sat up and cried beside his dead mother's body. James shouted at the baby and then killed him with a single shot to the center of his back. James then killed a truck driver, 62-year-old Lawrence, right before he targeted another family near the play area. The mother, Blythe, was shielding their 11-year-old son, Mateo. In the booth across from them was her husband, Ronald, shielding their son's 12-year-old friend, Keith. Ronald and Keith were shot numerous times but survived. Ronald's wife and son were less fortunate, dying of several shots to the head. Three 11-year-old boys, oblivious to the shooting, rode their bikes into the west side of the parking lot, ready to order ice cream sundaes. Someone yelled at them across from the street, so they hesitated. But it was too late. James saw them and shot the three boys with his Uzi and shotgun. Hi, I'm Cam, and this is the McDonald's Massacre Part 3. Three 11 year old boys rode their bikes into the west side of the parking lot, ready to order ice cream sundaes. Someone yelled at them from across the street, so they hesitated. But it was too late, James saw them and shot the three boys with his Uzi and shotgun. Joshua fell to the ground, critically wounded, but he survived. Omar received gunshots to the back and began vomiting on the ground. David was shot several times in the head. Omar and David both died at the scene. An elderly couple, 74 year old Miguel and 69 year old Ada, tried walking out the doors. As Miguel reached to open the door for his wife, James shot Ada with a shotgun to the face and wounded Miguel. Miguel cradled his wife in his arms and wiped the blood from her face. He shouted curses at James. James approached Miguel, swore at him, and then killed him with a single shot to the head. After police arrived, James went up to the service counter and adjusted the portable radio to the music station. He then started dancing to the music as he shot more innocent victims. 5.17 p.m., Chuck Foster, a SWAT sniper, fired a single round 35 yards away. He hit James and severed his aorta just beneath his heart. He died immediately. The entire event lasted 77 minutes, and James fired a total of 257 rounds. He killed 21 people. He is at 300 West. The shooting suspect is inside the McDonald's. He is contained moving around in there. Still stop being fired. He entered the facility heavily armed, immediately started shooting everybody. And uh, uh, the customers uh, that were inside the uh, restaurant uh, had absolutely no chance to escape. Oh, These images are more of war than of a small fast food restaurant in San Isidro. Yet it was a local man dressed in battle fatigues who declared, I have killed a thousand, I'm going to kill a thousand more. 41-year-old James Huberty reportedly walked into the restaurant carrying a semi-automatic rifle and two other weapons, enough ammunition to last two hours. Witnesses inside said he fired wildly into the unsuspecting crowd gathered it looked like a mass execution. Police hearing the calls coming across the radio were confused, not sure how to approach such a dangerous situation. It was all happening so fast. The SWAT team was called in to try and surround the building. Meanwhile, people who escaped, their bodies soaked with blood, were being taken care of by frantic emergency medical crews. The death toll started at 6, then 10, 20, and climbing. By 4.15, a virtual army of police and rescue personnel had crowded the main street through this border town. Suddenly, a shot was fired. Police radio screamed, he's down, he's down, the suspect's down. James Huberty had fallen to a SWAT sharpshooter's bullet. One single bullet killed the man who had apparently systematically fired, loaded, and reloaded his weapon to kill all those people. It all happened in about an hour. No one can explain why. Why anyone would take so many innocent lives. James Huberty didn't kill his thousand. He killed enough to shake a whole country. 
So here's the scoop on the top family murders. This family, no one could find them around December of 2019. Family members were like asking law enforcement to do wellness check. Law enforcement showed up, knocked on the door. They didn't answer. And so they just left until weeks later when they come serve a warrant on this dude for fraud in his medical practice. When they show up, they find out dude has been living in his house with his entire family murdered and all sleeping together in one room. They were drugged with Benadryl, then stabbed his wife, 13-year-old, 11-year-old, and 4-year-old. When he's first arrested, dude confesses. Uh, I don't know if he gave a reason. I've heard stories where he's like, I totally snapped and came to at the police department, but he confessed at one point. But fast forward a year, and now this slimy dude is saying that his wife drugged and killed her kids, drugged and killed herself, and now he's awaiting trial. This is an extremely disturbing case. So in August 2005, China Arnold of Ohio was having an argument over Paris' paternity with the dad. After they fought, she stuck her 28-day-old baby inside of this microwave for over two minutes. With it running, she ended up dying when her temperature reached 108. The next day, the parents took her to the hospital, and China tried to say that she was intoxicated so she doesn't know how the child died. But that was bullshit. While she was in jail awaiting trial, she ended up having a romantic relationship with her cellmate and she confessed to her how guilty she felt over the murder so that lady ended up testifying against her which caused china to get life in prison it's honestly so messed up china tried to get her other son to lie and say that the neighbor killed her baby but that was proved to be bs and now she'll rot in prison if you're like me you were probably recently traumatized by megan is missing well buckle in because we're about to talk about the real case it was based off of this is the case of ashley pond and miranda gaddis Ashley didn't meet her real father until she was about 9 or 10 and started staying with him. Family and friends started to notice a change in her attitude and behavior. Ashley eventually told her mother that she was being sexually assaulted by her father. Her father was charged with 40 counts of raping and sexual abuse. Ashley had a strained relationship with her mother, so she decided to move in with a friend, the daughter of a man named Ward Weaver. In early August 2001, Ashley confided in a teacher that Ward had been sexually abusing her. Police never investigated this. Ashley ended up moving back in with her mom, and her relationship with her got better, as well as her grades. On January 9th in 2002 at 8.15 in the morning, Ashley said goodbye to her mom and went to the bus stop. Although it was a 10 minute walk, Ashley never made it there. Her mother filed a report and family and friends started to look for her, including Miranda. I kind of believe that having a wedding of friends or something, it's just really different. Ashley and Amanda were friends and had both been sexually assaulted by their fathers. They both lived in the same neighborhood. Police started to suspect Weaver, but he wasn't arrested. Miranda started telling kids at school to stay away from Weaver's house. On March 8, 2002, Miranda went missing, two months after Ashley. On the way to her bus stop on the same route Ashley went missing on. Weaver was a suspect again, but they didn't have enough evidence for a warrant. On August 13, 2002, Weaver's own son called in to report that he had tried to rape his 19-year-old girlfriend and that he'd also admitted to killing both of the girls. On August 24th, by searching Weaver's house, they found the remains of Miranda in an empty microwave box. The following day, they found Ashley's remains buried under a concrete slab in a barrel. On September 22nd, 2004, Weaver pled guilty to murder of both of the girls. Miranda's younger sister visited Weaver twice in jail, and he told her that he killed the girls with his bare hands, and he admitted she would be his next victim if he wasn't caught. Weaver's own father had actually killed people and buried someone under a concrete slab before, and Weaver's own son went on to kill someone later. Calling all true crime fans. Let's go for a trip. I want to show you something. Going to Beverly Hills, California today. Do you guys recognize this property? I feel like I'll get your attention after I say his name. That house once belonged to the Menendez family. On August 20th, 1989, Jose and Mary Kitty Menendez were shotgunned to death in their home. Their sons, Lyle and Eric Menendez, were charged with the crime. Crime scene was brutal. So brutal that people thought it was a mob hit. Kitty was almost unidentifiable because she was hit 15 times with a 12 gauge shotgun. The boys called 911 saying that somebody had killed their parents. Let's talk about another murder that was solved 30 years later thanks to DNA. This is April Tinsley. There she is. 
1988, she was eight years old walking home from her friend's house, which was just three blocks away. She never came home, and some people saw her crying, getting dragged into a blue truck. Three days and 20 miles later, her body was found uh, face down in a ditch. There were a few suspects initially, nothing really panned out. Two years later, they found this message um, scrawled on a barn door. That was really it until 2004 when notes started popping up on little girls' bicycles. Notes that look like this. I'll do this so you can pause it. With these notes were uh, used condoms and photos of a man from the waist down. Obviously, the DNA in the condoms matched the DNA from April's body. 2018, Indiana passed a law saying felons had to submit their DNA, which is how they found John Miller. They showed up, said, do you know why we're here? He said, April Tinsley. Welcome to part six of the Bloody Alphabet. Today we are working with letter F and it is Albert Fish, also known as the Gray Man or the Werewolf of Wisteria. He was an American sadomasochist, serial killer, and cannibal. He boasted that he had killed children in every state, however we are not sure if this is true or not. He had a rough childhood and his dad died when he was young, so he was put into an orphanage. He was soon introduced to practices such as drinking urine and copophagia. From there, he ended up molesting young children, mainly boys under the age of six. He eventually developed a morbid interest in castration. One of his more well-known cases is with 10-year-old Grace Budd. She willingly went with him to go to a party. He ended up taking her to an abandoned house where he killed her and cut her up. His intentions were to cook her and eat it. Seven years after Grace went missing, he sent a letter to Grace's family about everything he did to her. Soon after they got this letter, Fish had been caught. Although there was only three known victims, there was definitely a lot more possible victims out there. Fish was finally executed on January 16, 1936 in the electric chair. And that is the story of Albert Fish. You know when bath salts were super popular a lot of people were using bath salts as a drug to get high basically the bath salt would make you hallucinate so in 2009 in miami florida rudy eugene was apparently high on bath salts he walked into a busy crowd took off all his clothes then walked over to where a homeless man was staying ronald popo 65 years old at the time and started eating his face off yes eating his face his nose his eyes his mouth he even tried taking off all his clothes. When witnesses saw what happened, they called police and police got over five calls of this. When police showed up, they told Rudy to stop doing what he was doing and apparently Rudy was growling at them. They said it was like he didn't understand what they were saying. And that went on for 18 minutes before they decided to shoot him dead. And look how this poor man turned out after. That's a horrible crime. Calling all true crime fans. Let's talk about this woman. On the outside, she just seems like your average older lady. However, this is Dorothea Puente, who, believe it or not, is a convicted serial killer. It was Sacramento in the 1980s when Dorothea here was running a boarding home for elderly people. Some of her tenants said that she was kind of stingy and would keep their mail from them. Other tenants said she was amazing and they loved her home-cooked meals. She was able to take the tougher cases from social workers, so drug addicts, so she was able to take a lot of people in. However, some of the elderly people started dying. And according to police reports, it was because of drug overdose, suicide, some of them even just of old age. However, in 1988, the social worker of Alfonso Montoya, who was schizophrenic, said that he was missing. So they went to her property to see what was going on. Here they found some disturbed soil. Never a good sign. They dug it up and found the body of Leona Carpenter. And here's where they discovered seven other bodies. They did also find Alberto on the property. So there was a total of nine murders confirmed, six unconfirmed. Turns out Dorothea found out her tenants had pretty big social security checks. At first, Dorothea was not a suspect and she was allowed to leave the property. Here's when she fled to Los Angeles, befriended an elderly person who recognized her on the news and turned her right in. And then in the end, Dorothea was only convicted of three murders. The jury could not decide on the other six. They also couldn't decide if she should get life in prison. However, under California law, she did. Up until the day she died, she maintained her innocence, claiming that all of her tenants died of natural causes. She died in 2011 due to natural causes. Interesting. This is the first bird to ever testify in court. On May 13, 2015, police arrive at a home near Sand Lake, Michigan. Inside, they find the bodies of Marty and Glenna Durham. Marty had been shot five times and Glenna was shot twice in the head but survived. After making a full recovery, Glenna told police that somebody had broken into their home before shooting them and fleeing. Marty's three children were going through things inside of his home when they found a manila envelope. Inside the envelope, they found suicide notes written by Glenna. Just a couple weeks before Marty's death, he received a phone call from a family member. The family member told him he had seen Marty's home in the foreclosure section of the newspaper. Marty had no idea about this as Glenna was the one that took over the
the bills, and she hid from him that they were facing foreclosure. Even after finding the suicide notes, Glenna still proclaimed she was innocent. That is, until Marty's parrot began reenacting the crime scene. The new owner noticed him arguing in two different voices, and the last thing he said was, Glenna was put on trial for the attempted murder-suicide of Marty Durham, and Marty's parrot was the key witness. 